Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Talk to me. Hallelujah. We are here tonight as living testimonies to the goodness of God. The blessings of God that he has prepared. The verse before this one, verse number five, says he had predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. That simply means he had predetermined. Pre simply means before. So pre Destinated simply means that your destination had been prearranged. God had concluded on where you will end before you started. And he said he predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. That is to say, he had decided before time that we are the ones who will be adopted. as the children of God. So we are not where we are by accident. We are not where we are by mistake. We are not where we are because we stumbled into it. It was predetermined that we should be where we are. Now, I'm saying this because I want you to keep something in mind as we progress. The fact that you are not an accident. That God had designed for you to be where you are today in his son. Now, when we talk about the predestination here, we are not talking about the fact that, okay, if you're a carpenter today, God has predestined that you should be a carpenter. No, we're talking about the predestination in Christ, your salvation, that you are not a Christian by accident, that you are not sitting in the church because because you like sitting in the church. No, it was predetermined. This, this emphasis is very crucial because it, it gives, it strengthens your faith. It strengthens your faith to the fact that you can always confidently say, Lord, you are the one who placed me in Christ. My salvation was not by power. It was not by mind. It wasn't because I was smarter than the guy next door that I gave my life to Christ and they didn't. You had a plan, a purpose in Christ for raising me. So if you will jump back to verse number three, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now notice that God had prepared your blessings. And those blessings were not kept in your place of work. Those blessings were kept in Christ. So that this is where he was taking you to. That's where he organized for your parcel to be delivered. Are you with me? Are you with me? Are you with me tonight? Talk to me. Don't nod your head. Are you with me tonight? Now, now, if you live at number 17, Blockham Dre Street, and I bought you a gift from Take A Lot, and I gave your address as number 17, Blockham Dre Street, the parcel will be delivered at number 17. Is that not so? Because that is where you and I had an agreement you would be. Now, in this case, the believer's blessing, I'm saying this tonight because I want to drive you onto something to prepare your mind for the new month we are going into so that you, no matter what happens, protect your relationship with God. Protect your place in Christ. Are you hearing what I'm saying here? The Bible says in the book of Revelation, he says, hold fast your crown that no man takes it. When you fight for your place in Christ, resisting temptations, resisting the afflictions 
that the enemy puts on you, resisting the influence and the seduction that is in the world. It's not because you are stupid. It's not because you are not busy enough. That's why you are always in the house of God. No. The, the, the reason why you are holding tight, fighting very hard, is because whatever takes away your relationship with Christ has stolen your destiny. It's stolen your destiny. This is the reason why you cannot gamble with your relationship with the Lord. We are living in a generation where there is so much effort to impress. There is so much effort to be seen. There is so much info effort to acquire titles and recognitions. There is so much effort to, uh, to assess a certain status in the society. And this madness has crept into the church. And you discover uh, that most Christians are where they are not because they understand that this is a matter of life and death, but because they want to impress. Also, our generation has been infected with a certain confusion that is blowing like an evil wind across the world in the body of Christ, where there are arguments as to if I can work very hard, I don't have to pray, God will prosper me. I don't have to be faithful in my giving to God because my prosperity is not tied to that because God does not bless people financially. If you work very hard, you prosper. Now, that is madness. That is madness. That is the height of confusion. And this, you see, the reason why most Christians are falling prey to these manipulations is because they do not know the Bible for themselves. And most of them do not have a personal relationship with God. Their relationship with God is on a religious platform. That is the reason why you are easily influenced and pushed around by every wind of doctrine. We were predestined to be in Christ, into the adoption of sons in Christ. And our blessing was packaged in Christ. Look at it. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He says they are in Christ. Now he calls them spiritual blessings. Why does he call them spiritual blessings? Because God is a spirit. God does not own a car. He does not need one. Because if he wants to go to Kempton, he does not need to drive. You know why? Because he lives in Kempton. He said, well, what if he wants to go to Pretoria? The point is, he lives in Pretoria. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. God is a spirit. God does not need a house. You need a house because you live in the physical. God is a spirit. So when God, look, like begets like. That's what the Bible teaches us. The scripture teaches us that like begets like. A spirit will bet a spirit. That is why in John chapter 3, when Jesus was talking about being born again, he talked about, he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit because a flesh will give birth to flesh. The spirit will give birth to spirit. So if God will package you a blessing, that blessing can only be spiritual. Are you with me? But here is what the Bible says. Mm. <laughs> Let me show you this. Because the Bible, the word of God is so complete that when you understand it, it blesses you.
Give me Proverbs chapter 10. I'm looking for the right translation that would give me the clarity that I'm looking for. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, put it in the King James Version. He says, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. The blessing of the Lord does what? It maketh rich, and he added no sorrow with it. I'm going to stay with the first part. In case you are looking at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and you are saying, the Bible says that God has blessed us with all. He calls it spiritual blessings. The blessings of God are not physical. The blessings of God are not material. The blessings of God are spiritual. They can only be spiritual because God is a spirit. However, the blessings of God are a channel. They are a passage to whatever might be your human need. So this scripture says the blessings of the Lord, it maketh rich. So this scripture separates riches from blessing. Are you following me tonight? This scripture separates blessings from riches. So the fact that a Christian is not rich does not mean he's not blessed. The blessing is supposed to lead you to your riches. Are you hearing what I'm saying here? So what then is the blessing? The blessing of God upon your life, because it is spiritual, can be an inspiration. The blessings of God can be favor. Are you listening to what I'm saying here? When you say a man is blessed, you are saying that he carries the presence of God. So it is. It is left for you as a child of God to be able to appropriate the blessing. Know how to use the blessing to get to your riches. The riches can be houses. The riches can be money. The riches can be cars. can be a business. It can be anything. That same blessing, as you study through the scripture, you will discover that same blessing is the one that guarantees your access to divine help. So all that God has packaged for his children is called what? The blessing. The blessing. That's what God has packaged for his children. So to say God does not give people cars, you are true, you might be, you are halfway true on your assessment of the situation. Yes, but he gives a blessing. And it is the blessing that produces the car. When God created man in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 28, the Bible says, and God blessed him. Genesis 1. What did he do to them? What did he do to them? No, talk to me. Can you read? What did he do to them? He blessed them. That's the first. Okay, start from verse 26. Say with me, I'm blessed. Amen. Now, I'm not asking you to say you are blessed because you are sitting in church. No, you are blessed because you are in Christ. Remember, remember where we're coming from. Ephesians chapter 1, we read from verse number 1. When we got to verse number 4 and verse 5, you saw what, it says we were predestined to be in Christ. And I showed you in verse 3 that the blessing 
is in Christ. That is why he made sure that your passage will carry you through where? Through Christ. You have to be in Christ to be successful in the world. Now, look with me. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth. If I had time, if I'm, I'm going to take a few minutes to uh, address one or two things here because he talks about dominion over the fish of the sea now and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle. Please notice that everything he said there was not in plural, it was in single tense. This is a teaching that I don't want to rush through, so I'm not going to emphasize on it much. He says, have dominion over the fish. It didn't say the fishes. There's a reason for that. Over the fowl of the air. It is the fowls of the air. Over the cattle, not the cattle. Because when he was addressing, what he was addressing here was not actually physical, it was spiritual. I did a teaching here a while ago when I told you, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9, it says, I have not seen, ear has not heard. You notice he does not say, Eyes have not seen. He didn't say ears. He said eye. He said ear. Because in the realm of the spirit, you don't have two eyes. You have one. But that was not my pursuit. I don't know. I'm trying not to linger here because there's something here speaking about dominion. Speaking about dominion. But let's move quickly because I, I, I was aiming at teaching you something this evening before we break the bread. And we are on our way there slowly. So he gave them dominion over all these things. He gave them all this dominion. Now look at verse number 27. So God created man in his own image. In his image created him. He, him, male and female. Created he, them. So at the beginning he created. Those of you who joined the first lady on radio today, you had her giving that powerful exposition. Glory to God. Were you blessed by that thing? It was massive. It was massive. The response has been something else, but she was talking so much from this passage of scripture. And um, male and female created them. Now look at verse number 28. And God blessed them. And God blessed them. Because that's what God does. Then God said, by virtue of the blessing, you cannot be barren, you'll be fruitful. Are you seeing it now? By virtue of the blessing, you can multiply. By virtue of the blessing, you can replenish the earth. By virtue of the, earth, by the blessing, you can subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. My emphasis here is the blessing. The blessing. So when you say, I'm blessed, I want you to, to, to have an understanding of what you are saying. The next time you say to somebody, you are blessed, you, you should understand what you are talking about. Are you getting what I'm saying? Your blessing is in Christ. That's where it is. In Christ. I'm blessed, not because I'm a church member. I'm blessed because I'm in Christ. I'm blessed, not because I meet your expectations. No, I'm blessed because in spite of my inability to meet your expectations, Christ has accepted me. He's made room for me in the beloved. In Christ. Now, your life in Christ is supposed to be established. Please go back to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, where we read verse number 4. Verse number 4. 
He says, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. I want to move on to the subject of being holy. In Christ, being holy. In the book of Galatians, Paul does, the scripture does, gives us an insight into the works of the flesh. And how damaging the flesh can be if you allow it to rule your life. There are three classes of people or there is, there is this three class of people that the scripture teaches us about. He talks to us about the spiritual man. Then he speaks to us about the natural man. Then he speaks to us about the carnal man. The man of the flesh. Your ability as a child of God that is in Christ to subdue the flesh. The word actually we normally use is to crucify the flesh. Is what gives you boldness and confidence in your inheritance in Christ. You will discover that the Bible tells us about Jesus in Romans chapter 1, how that he was declared to be the son of God by the spirit of holiness. Romans chapter 1, quickly verse 3 and verse 4. Let's see it quickly. Romans 1, verse 3 and verse 4. He says, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now hold on there. He was made. That means when he says he was made of, of the seed of David, that means he came from David. You understand? In the flesh. That's in the, in the physical. He was the seed of David. All right. Uh, according to the flesh. According to the flesh. Verse number four. He says, and declared to be the son of God with power. He was declared to be, the, this is where I'm heading to tonight. He was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. By the resurrection from the dead simply means by the crucifixion of the flesh. When his body was crucified, when his body was, was, was destroyed, was killed, when his body was, was offered as a sacrifice because he had carried our sins on his body when he was on the cross. The scripture says that by that situation, when he died, died in the flesh, when he died in his body, he had to physically die in the body to signify what God wants from us. A cutting off of the flesh. He says, by that resurrection, by, by dying and leaving it there and waking up and rising to a newness of life, he says he was able to establish his sonship, his place as the son of God, and he could demonstrate the power that is attached to that position of being a son of God. Remember, John chapter 1 verse 12, but as many as receive him, everyone, all of us seated here, who have received him, he gave the power. The, can I say this? The believer in Christ is not ordinary. The believer in Christ is not just a nice person. The believer in Christ is not just a good person who just loves his neighbor. No, the believer in Christ is a supernatural being. He's endued with power. 
any attempt to separate this power, this life of dominion from the believer in Christ makes him just a good nobody. That's what it does. Brothers and sisters, do you know there are people in the world who are not born again, they don't go to church, but they don't fornicate. Do you know? Morally, they are very sound. They've got moral standards that many people in the church. Do you know there are people in the church who don't steal? I mean, who are not in the church, they don't steal. They don't lie. They've got standards. They've got principles. They walk by those principles. But you see, that still does not make them acceptable before God. Because what makes us acceptable before God is not our good works. It's our embrace of the person of the Lord Jesus. The Bible says that if we believe in him, we've become the sons of God. So, I'm saying this to say that The guy who is not born again, who is morally sound, will then not be different from you. If you are being in Christ, it's just because you are in Christ, so you are a good person. You don't lie. You don't speak bad words. You are not different. What makes you different is the power. Everybody say the power. Say the power. Say the power. That power is the power of dominion. It's what gives you dominion. Over the force, the, the spiritual force in the water. When he was talking about the fish of the sea, he was talking about the force that rules in the water. Let me show you something. I was trying not to go there, but I think I should show you. <laughs> Isaiah. Glory to God. Mm. Are you still here? Chapter 23. Just read one verse, verse number four. He said, Be thou ashamed, O Zidon, for the sea had spoken. There is a voice that speaks from the sea. Listen, read. Even the strength of the sea, he calls it the strength of the sea, saying, I travel not, nor bring forth children, neither do I nourish up young men, nor bring up virgins. That's the description of the forces of the water. They don't raise virgins. They are responsible for promiscuity and for immorality. There is the force that speaks from the water. We call it the marine spirit. Whatever it is you call it. It speaks. He calls it the strength of the sea. The strength of the sea. Paul writes about the prince of the powers of the air. The forces that rule in the atmosphere. Brothers and sisters, John wrote and he said the whole world lies in wickedness. There are powers, there are forces that need to be subdued. And for as long as you say you are a child of God, from the moment you declare yourself a child of God, they will contend with you. Your frustration is their satisfaction. Your stagnation is their source of laughter. They speak and they continue to speak. So for you to prevail as a child of God and be able to subdue the strength of the sea, for example, you need to function in a life of dominion. 
But I am trying to point you to what makes it real. It is the ability to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Every time you come before the communion table, I want you to think of this one thing. Think of the reason why the body was broken. The body stands for the flesh. It stands for the body. It stands for the flesh. The flesh had to be broken. I was reading to you Genesis chapter 40. Quickly, let's look at that. Maybe that's as the, part, the last passage of scripture before we begin to tie, tie this up now. Because I was, I was so blessed by Genesis chapter number 40. Uh, let's read a few verses here. Um, Joseph is in prison and look at verse number five. And it came to pass. Um, <sighs> Genesis chapter verse five. Oh, yeah, there we are. And they dreamed. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night. Give me the amplified. And they both dreamed a dream. Now the butler and the baker. Remember, the butler and the baker, they were in prison with Joseph. And they, happened, they had to be in the same cell with Joseph. Not a coincidence. It's called destiny. It's a message. It had to happen. Because there was, this is what you will call the reflections of Christ in the Old Testament. Remember that the entire Old Testament is a shadow of what was supposed to come. And your entire Bible from Genesis to Malachi is an effort to present the Son of God, Jesus, that we now see revealed in the New Testament. So it was not coincidence that the baker and the butler were the two that were arrested. It was not the chief security guy that was arrested, that was thrown into jail. It was the baker. The baker is the one who makes the bread. The butler is the one who gives the wine. And the two of them, the Bible says, are arrested. The king takes offense at them and Drop them into the prison. And the boat, they were in the prison. And they didn't just end up in prison. They had to end up in prison where Joseph was. What a coincidence. No, not coincidence. Destiny. So, they both dreamed a dream in the same night. Coincidence? No. Tell your neighbor, No. They both dream a dream, same night. <laughs> Each man, I asked you to read the AMP because I wanted to see the language. Each man according to the personal significance of the interpretation of his dream. So the dream had a significance. Each man, that means each person's office had something to offer in this dream they had. It says, each man according to the personal significance of the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in the prison. It gives you a picture of the natural man before Jesus came. That we were confined in a prison. We were confined in the prison where the devil had the key. But the ability of Joseph, mm, so get it this way the butler and the baker had to go into that prison. Not because of themselves, but because Joseph was there. 
And for Joseph to get out of that prison, the two of them had to be there complete because that is the picture of the natural man, the body and the blood of the Son of God. That's the reason why Jesus said in John chapter number 5, he makes it clearly, he says, if you don't eat my flesh and my body, he said you have no life in you. To have no life in you simply means you are still in prison. Joseph is able to interpret the meaning of their dreams and the interpretation again has a significance because Joseph then says to the butler, don't worry, what is your dream? He said, this is the dream. He says to the baker, what was your dream? The baker says, this is my dream. It's, it's, I wish, can we just read a bit? And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, behold, a vine was before me, a vine, a vine. Do you remember the vine? When Jesus said, I would not drink of this vine with you anymore. The vine. At the last supper, when they sat at the table, Jesus spoke about the vine. He said, I dreamed. Behold, a vine was before me, verse number 10. And in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters therefore brought forth ripe grapes. Ripe grapes. Keep reading. Keep reading. And Pharaoh's cup... Everybody say Pharaoh's cup. Yeah, the cup. So when you take the cup tonight, I want you to, to know what it, the significance of the cup. Pharaoh's cup. Pharaoh's cup. Pharaoh was the king. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. And I gave the cup onto Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. I showed you this the other day. Three days of Jesus going to the grave. Of his blood being spilled. Of his blood being crushed into the cup, into the vessel. When Jesus came out from the grave, the first person he met was who? Mary, remember, when Mary wanted to touch him, he said, don't touch me, Mary said, because I have not presented myself to my father. I need to first show myself to my father because he needed, in, needed to present his blood before the father. When did it happen? It happened just after the resurrection. Remember, a few days later, when the disciples were in the room and the doors were closed, and Jesus appeared in the room, there was a man there called Thomas. Remember Thomas? The one who didn't believe Jesus, it was even Jesus. So when the other disciples told him, look, brother Thomas, you were not here. Jesus rose, and he said, I don't believe until I see. Now when Jesus appeared in that room, a few days later, what did he say to Thomas? He said, Thomas, come and touch now, a few days back, he said to Mary, don't touch me. Because he needed to present his blood before the Father. It was very interesting. You know, we're discussing today after the radio broadcast. And we're talking about the, the role of the women in ministry and how that is so significant and how so many Christians have not... Have, so many Christians have not discovered the power of the women in ministry. And we've allowed tradition to always push us behind and allow the enemy. I don't really think it's tradition. I think it's, it's satanic. I think it's demonic. I think it's Satan's, Satan's manipulative idea to keep the greatest tool that God will have wanted to use. Because we're establishing that the first person, the first minister who carried the word was a woman. Like she was teaching on radio today. Mary. Mary is the one who carried the word here for nine months. She's the one who brought forth. So whatever we are preaching today, she carried it life here. She bettered the word to us in the flesh. 
And it's so interesting that when Jesus rose from the dead, it, the first person he sees is a woman. And he does not just see her, he commits the gospel to her also. He says to her, go and tell my brethren. Go and give them the good news. Tell them I have risen. What is the good news? The gospel. Why was it not a man? I'll show you something on Sunday. I'll show you something. If there is any thing the devil is scared of, it's the woman. I'll show you. We are going into the women's month, August. If there is anything the devil fears, and that is why you discover that when the devil gets hold of a woman, he uses her very well. I love what she said on radio today. When she said, when she said, the devil uses women. Most of the Sangomas are women. It is in the church that we push the women behind. But the devil sees the potential in them and he uses them very well. He uses them full time. As soon as they submit to him, just like if a woman submits to God, she becomes a dangerous tool in the hands of God. There's something about the composition of a woman that remains a mystery. Glory to God. So the scripture tells us that the blood was what this meant. Joseph interprets and he says, the three branches are three days, verse number 13 quickly, Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head and restore thee unto thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou was, when thou was his butler. Quickly, verse 14. But think on me when it shall be well with thee and shew kindness, I pray thee unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh and bring me out of this house. Because Joseph didn't know that his deliverance was just tied to the revelation. It was not tied to the help from that man. He didn't need human connection. As soon as you have the revelation, the blessing will work. Just put it to work. Get a revelation of the blessing. Get a revelation of what the blood of Jesus did for you. It will take care of the rest. Joseph was busy campaigning. When you get there, please remember me. But the Bible tells us when he got out, he didn't even remember Joseph. But what was going to deliver him was his ability to interpret. Because when eventually an interpreter was needed, this guy remembered there was a man who told me my dreams. So it was his revelation. It was not his hustling or campaigning that got him out of the problem. It was his revelation. And I want you tonight to catch a revelation of the blood and understand that there is no greater blessing given to us as God's children than the blessing of the blood that was shed for us. Number two thing I want you to pick up. Just keep reading quickly. I want to pick up the second point and then I'm done. For indeed, okay, go to 16, 17 quickly where the, 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 the second guy is talking. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I, was, I also was in my dream. Now, I want you to note the, the choice of words here. Not the choice of words. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, what does that tell you? That is a clear description of the flesh at work. I've told you several times that imitation, imitation, when people imitate, Imitation is a product of lack of intimacy. When you don't know God for yourself, when you don't have an intimate revelation of who you are in Christ, know who Christ is because the more of Christ you know, the more you know who you are. You want to be like others. If others do this one, you want to do, you think it is because they are doing it, that's why they are getting popular, that's why they are known. You don't understand that they are fulfilling their destiny. 
That's why it's working for them. You will discover that what everybody is doing, when you go and do it, it will not work. Look at this man. This is a clear description of the flesh. So the guy come forward. When he saw that the other guy's interpretation was good, he came forward. said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. As soon as you hear basket in the New Testament, the first thing that comes to your mind is what? Bread, of course. Praise the Lord. Bread. <laughs> the guy was good in baking bread. And in the uppermost basket, there was of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh. And the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. Do you know why his dream failed? Because he was not supposed to give to Pharaoh meat. His job was the job of a baker. That's what the flesh does. The flesh makes you present Present strange fire before God. The flesh, it makes you present the wrong kind of worship. The flesh. If I had time, I'll read you that scripture in the book of Galatians where it talks about the works of the flesh. From jealousy. Pride, arrogance, the flesh. It makes you present the wrong thing. His job was the job. Did you see? The butler presented the right thing. His job was the job of presenting what? Wine to the king. He brought, he squeezed grapes and presented. And the interpretation was, you are coming out, you'll be elevated, you'll be established. Now, my friend, who is working in the flesh? The baker is your description of the flesh that needs to be broken, that needs to be crucified, that needs to be put down. That's the essence of our breaking. Every time we come before the communion table, we say, take the bread. We say, break it. It's the significance is that you have broken the flesh. You have crucified the flesh. You have subdued the flesh. That's why the scripture says the flesh, no flesh will glory before God. So his dream was wonderful. He had meat instead of bread in the basket. Next verse. And Joseph answered him and said, this is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days, just like Jesus rose in three days, into newness of life, shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee and shall hang thee on a tree and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. When we get to the point where we can handle the flesh, Galatians chapter 5, I didn't want to read another scripture. But I think we should read it. Verse 24. And they that are Christ, those who are in Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lost. The NIV calls it its passions and desires. The flesh and its passions and its desires. This, brothers and sisters, is what establishes our relationship in Christ. Our ability to crucify the flesh. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passion and desires. Keep reading 25. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Why? Because the blessings are spiritual. The blessings are spiritual. Hmm. I like verse number 26, finally, the last verse. 
He says, let us not become conceited, provoking. Now go to the King James. Stay in the King James. He says, let us not be desirous of vain glory. Don't desire it. It's the work of the flesh. Vain glory. You know what vain glory does? Vain glory is the one that says, I have to be the one to do it. If I do not do it, nobody else can do it as good as me. It's got to be me. And as soon as someone else is taken to do it, you feel like, oh, they are lifting that one now. That's the one everybody is going to see. So instantly you feel threatened. You feel threatened. You may not tell anybody, but it's there in your mind. And because God sees the heart, instantly it cuts you off. You just want to be the one to do it. So everybody will say, oh, there goes the super, super, super spiritual. And when you walk around, you walk around with the mindset that they know, they know who is doing the job. They know who is doing the job. They know who is doing it. You may not tell anybody. But you seek in vain glory. He says, provoking one another, envying one another. Give it to me in the message translation. He said, that means we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another worse. I'm trying to show you how the flesh manifests itself. It doesn't matter how many times you break bread. If your consciousness is not established in working in that reality, that the body that is broken signifies the crucifixion of the flesh. We crucify the flesh. That this is how it's been broken. There is nothing you break that will not cause pain. Is that not so? In your body. Hello? Which part of your body will break and it will not be painful? Is it your nose? Is it your toes? So when you break, I want you to carry the consciousness that this is costing me something, but I'll let it be. It's like you've been in a place for so long and then suddenly one brother arrived recently and it looks like he's the one that is now shining everybody. You see, the truth is you need to understand that everyone has their destiny and nobody can outshine you except you don't understand the brilliance of your own light. If you understand what you offer, you will realize that they are playing their part and playing my part. So I don't have to do it because you are doing it. No. He says they compare, compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. Say with me, I'm an original. Say it with confidence. Say, I am an original. Hmm. Every time you compare with yourself with somebody, in your mind, you have instantly made yourself inferior to that person. You've made yourself inferior. Mm -hmm.